Modern philosophy is established on the idea that we don't have any access to the reality of things. All we can perceive are our own internal thoughts and states that are completely separate from reality. As Bertrand Russell makes the point, what I maintain is that we can witness or observe what goes on in our heads and that we cannot witness or observe anything else at all. During the same time as modern philosophy took its first steps, modern science was also established with the central task to inquire the reality as it is independent of our minds and opinions. Between the modern philosophy and science lies then a deep contradiction. Whereas the science seeks to inquire the mind independent reality, philosophy claims that we have access only to the mind dependent reality. How it is then possible that modern philosophy would begin with a claim that makes the project of modern science unattainable? It is certainly odd that the early moderns, who were first and foremost men of science, would choose the way of ideas that leads to an idealistic worldview. Why on earth would the self-proclaimed realists choose idealism? That is the question of this video. We have to remember that the great insight of the early moderns was the idea that reality could be understood through mathematics. These pioneers claimed that the essence and language of reality are mathematical. The Book of Nature is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometrical figures without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders about in a dark labyrinth. The moderns realized that in order to reach the full potential of our observations, they had to be mathematized. And starting with the mathematization of physics, science was taking unseen steps, surpassing the metaphysical speculations of the medieval philosophers. Through mathematics, new aspects of nature were revealed to us in a miraculous speed. But what do we know about the essences or the being of mathematical forms? At least since the days of Plato's Academy, it has been well known that the objects of mathematics are not as such accessible to sense. For example, the theorem that the interior angles of a plane triangle must equal 180 degrees concerns triangle in the abstract. It is not this or that triangle, but triangle pure and simple. It concerns the nature of triangle that makes triangles triangles and not circles or squares. The triangle in the abstract which is, in itself, unperceivable, is the object of the theorem, not this or that drawn and therefore perceivable triangle. So the only thing left for the moderns was to develop a philosophical view that would justify an immediate access to the mathematical reality, to the mathematical forms that were the essence of reality. They thought that this was possible through the way of ideas, which divided the world into quantifiable soulless matter and into a mind that quantifies it. This is the shortcut that the moderns took, blinded by the ecstatic development of science. But as we know, it wasn't a shortcut to realism, but instead to idealism. That is why we call it the early modern bluff. But now it's time to inquire how we could access mathematical entities through our common everyday observations. The medieval and modern philosophers were both interested in the question, how do we perceive the reality? There was even an agreement that the aim of science is to determine 
what the reality of the things is in its own right and not simply what they are in relation to us as observers. Even still, they agreed on what the sensible qualities of common observations were. The differences lies then in the order of primacy of these sense qualities. That is, what sense qualities were the basic ones and which were derivatives. So, what are we sensing in our common observations? Our sense qualities are color, shape, size, solidity, texture, position, motion, number, warmth, odor, flavor, and sound. Now for the moderns, the immediate interest was to get a mathematical hold of the objects of experience, whereas the sensible qualities as such were of second importance. The moderns then divided these qualities into the primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are the ones that are based on quantity, giving us an immediate access to mathematics, while the secondary qualities are qualitative, without immediate access to mathematics. The distinction between the primary and secondary sense qualities is also mirrored in the modern separation of the subjective and objective. For example, take this apple. We can disagree what the actual experience color of it is, or how it tastes or smells, because these are all subjective qualities. But we can objectively verify the shape, size and solidity of this apple without any room for disagreement, because those are objective qualities. This was the way of the new physics. Whereas the physics of Aristotle was based on the sensible matter, new physics was based on mathematics. New physics would cut below the subjective qualities of bodies to the objectively quantifiable base that, according to moderns, all sense qualities presuppose anyway. After all, sense qualities are secondary qualities inscribed in objects by our own mental activity whereas the quantitative qualities are present in the objects regardless of our opinions. Sounds nice and simple. Almost too simple. The moderns thought that they had secured an objective and realist foundation for the project of science. But in reality they had sealed themselves from reality and now find themselves in a closed room with Mr. Hyde. It was a false shortcut the early modern block. Bishop Berkeley saw the implications of this view. They who assert that figure, motion and the rest of primary qualities do exist without the mind in unthinking substances, do at the same time acknowledge that colors, sounds, heat, cold and such like secondary qualities do not, which they tell us are sensations existing in the mind alone, that depend on and are occasioned by the different size, texture and motion of the minute particles of matter. But I desire anyone to reflect and try whether he can, by any abstraction of thought, conceive the extension and motion of a body without all other sensible qualities. For my own part, I see evidently that it is not in my power to frame an idea of a body extended and moved, but I must withal give it some color or other sensible quality which is acknowledged to exist only in the mind. In short, extension, figure and motion abstracted from all other qualities are inconceivable. Where, therefore, the other sensible qualities are, there must these be also, to wit, in the mind and nowhere else. In other words, if the primary qualities are the real aspects of the objects and secondary qualities are only subjective illusions that we attach to these objects, how can we separate these two types of qualities from one another? Namely, our access to primary qualities happens through secondary qualities. 
For example, we perceive shape and motion through color. There is then no immediate access to the primary qualities themselves and therefore no possibility to reach the quantifiable objects of experience separately. Let us go through this one more time. We do not have a direct access to the primary qualities, which the modern saw as the reality of things, except through our secondary sense qualities. But if our secondary sense qualities are subjective and therefore illusionary, we do not have any access to reality. Everything we experience could just be a subjective illusion. We cannot thus mathematize the reality directly and immediately as Descartes and Galileo hoped. All we can perceive are secondary qualities and if they are subjective mental activities, meaning that they have no real connection to reality, there cannot be any certainty that we are experiencing anything else than our own mind. And we land once again to the problem of the external world. You notice how, again, Mr. Hyde enters in a slightly different form from a slightly different angle. In summary, the early moderns had realistic intentions and sincere goals of inquiring the reality, but the shortcut they took in hopes of mathematizing the whole of experience led them straight into idealism. <laughs>